Good morning. The Bible reading is indeed from Revelation. Um, 21, we'll start at uh, verse, we'll read verse 10, and then we'll skip through to verses 22 to 27, and finally, finishing up in Revelation 22, 1 to 5. A challenge, I'm sure. Um, interesting enough with the, the book of Revelation, uh, at least four times the author refers to himself as John, but, but even today there is a body of thought that suggests um, it's not necessarily John the Apostle. Um, there is some real evidence uh, that came from the third century, in fact, that um, convinced uh, a number of people that it was actually written by a chap called John the Presbyter or John the Elder, uh, who is uh, who was mentioned many times in, in our ancient writings. But that aside, it was written around the year 95 when uh, uh, Christians were entering a time of uh, a real persecution. The, um, the Roman authorities at the time were, were beginning to introduce and enforce emperor worship. So there was a lot of pressure on, on Christians, of course, uh, who were not uh, subscribing to that view. And just to encourage you to read it and prove me wrong, there are 52 references to the number seven in the book of Revelation. And I'm talking about churches, spirits, trumpets, plagues, hills, etc., etc. Um, and I believe that the number seven is a, a symbolic uh, for completeness. So there's a little bit of extra um, knowledge for you. Let's read. Verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a mountain great and high and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. To 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And from 22. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and the, his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night, they will not need the light, the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. And this is the word of the Lord. And Reverend David will now uh, give us some more information about the holy city. Thank you, Paul. I love the, uh, the context that you give us to our readings and get, get a sense of the, the historicity of it and so forth, and that's uh, much appreciated. It's interesting to me that uh, the place that for many they would say they encounter God is more usually in nature than the built environment of the city. Here we have a deliberate depiction of the social reality in which God is central, described as a city. 
The city is the pinnacle of human social organization, the complexity, the interconnectedness, the ingenuity, the creativity of human beings are given their fullest expression in the city. The fact that we humans often make poor decisions and we exclude some people and we damage our environment rather badly uh, means that it's not surprising that for many getting away from the city is the place they get a greater sense of God or the divine or spirit or something. But as far as the testimony of scripture is concerned, the general revelation of the works of God's hand in creation are eloquent at revealing God, but it's in the midst of human relationships that God is most at home and most fully revealed. So the city is an entirely appropriate metaphor for God's rich, abundant presence. And in this vision of the city, there is no temple. God's presence is unconfined. In the history of Israel, of course, up until this time that uh, the revelation was written, God had dwelt in a temple. God was not in the habit of taking up residence wherever it might suit God at the time. There were special places, sacred spaces. These were consecrated to be appropriate for God's presence. Everywhere else was not appropriate. God is holy. The world is deemed unholy. Temples were like special outposts of heaven, if you like, much like an embassy in a foreign land is deemed to be the territory of the nation it represents. So in the, in the unholiness of the world, there needed to be special outposts of heaven, as it were, as God's holy places, these temples, and this was not the case in John's vision of the city here. God filled the whole place. There was no need for a temple. And the glory of God shines and enables everyone to see. And here is a confusing metaphor. God's present, presence everywhere and the divine glory shining seems to perform the role of the thing we call the sun, the star that, you know, shines during the day for us. The glory of God provides light by which to see. And at first blush, this seems like the notion of that you sometimes see in those old movies where the explorer's in the dark cave and they find the old chest and they open it up and it, ah, all these jewels glow and you see it in their face and they light up. Somehow this kind of idea comes to my mind, but I think this is a more profound idea, actually. The idea of perceiving clearly in a manner that is consistent with what actually is. That's what the glory of God enables us to do, to see clearly in a manner consistent with what actually is. And that's a particularly relevant idea in our day, I think, because today people appear to be able to observe an event, any event at all, and to see something different in it, read it in entirely different ways. It's almost like we engage life and its meaning a bit like the way one engages an abstract painting. We see the things we like and dislike. Like the colours in that one, nice shapes in that one, I think I can see a face in that one, and we read into it the meaning that we want to see. By contrast, the glory of God renders all things clearly as they are. Spin and obfuscation will have no effect. The glory of God will provide devastatingly clear awareness of what actually is. And it says, the kings will bring their glory into this city and the, and the inhabitants will delight in their service to one another and to their God. No one will be forced. No one will feel the crush of external compulsion. The kings willingly bring their glory because they know theirs is a reflected glory. Just like the moon in the night sky, it shines, but only to the extent that it reflects the light 
of the sun. It has no light of its own. And the true kings of the earth understand this about their own glory. They know that they will shine all the more the closer they are to their God. And they will honour the one true God, not from fear of exclusion, not as an attempt to gain further power, but in the full-hearted acknowledgement that God is the source of all true glory. And all the people will serve, not because they are, there are um, adjutants prodding them to get going, not to gain some kind of social credits, as has been a move in some cultures, nor to lift their status in the city. None of that. All the people will serve because it will be their genuine heartfelt delight to do so. They will know the wonder of enriching the lives of those around them. They will experience the fulfilment of living into the image of God in which they were created. Their sense of well-being will not be the poverty of individuals who constantly compete for dominance over or recognition from one another. Rather, their delight will be to build the body, to strengthen the whole community, to deepen the bonds of genuine love. And in this city, there will be no fear. And we know this because the heavy gates that in case of threat would be pulled, closed and seal the city from any intruders, stay open all the time. There is no night because the light of the day is the presence of God who dwells there forever in this city. So the gates are always open. Such is the sense of security and well-being. And this is an apt metaphor, I think, for the way that we engage the world. For we know that when we are secure, we can engage openly with the rest of the world. But when the threat level rises, the default response is to shut things down. We saw that in the pandemic. The uncertainty regarding what's out there causes us to restrict access so we can vet what's coming in and going out and make an assessment of whether it's dangerous or not. But the incredible thing about this city is, and the phrasing related to this is really unique, the phrasing indicates unclean things and those who do detestable things and liars, these will not come into the city, even though the doors are open. It does not say that such things will no longer exist. It doesn't even say such things or people will be excluded. It says they won't come in. It is an incorruptibly holy city. That which does not sit well with holiness will prefer to stay away. 1992, Steve Martin was in a film called Leap of Faith. Anyone seen Leap of Faith? He plays Jonas Nightingale, a religious fraudster. And he goes around, he's a, a fraudulent Christian healer, and he makes a living traveling around America, holding revival meetings and conducting miracle tent meetings with the help of his entourage. They're very clever. They plant things on people as they're coming in. There's two-way radio communication. They listen to conversations so he knows he can point people out of the crowd and all sorts of... It's a very clever little show that they put on. One of their trucks breaks down in a little town called Rustwater a town in desperate need of rain to save their crops. And while waiting for the spare parts to arrive, Jonas decides to hold a revival meeting in the town. But the tensions begin to build as the local sheriff, who's very sceptical, rightly so, of Jonas, tries to prevent his town and his people from being conned. And at the same time, there's a local disabled boy who believes, he really believes, that Jonas can make him walk again. Of course, no one is more shocked when, towards the end of the film, the boy comes to the stage using his crutches, staggering up, and he clings to this huge cross figure of Jesus on the cross, and then lets go of his crutches and staggers back, and he can walk. He really can actually 
walk. This is not part of the act. The boy grew up in this little town. The people knew him. It's a genuine miracle that has taken place. And later that same evening, after the healing, the boy comes to ask Jonas Nightingale if he might travel with the group and become part of the team. And Nightingale openly confesses that he's a fraud. He confesses that he's been running schemes his whole life. And he says, one thing you've got to look out for, and it's not the cops. You can always get around the cops. The one thing you've got to look out for is a genuine article. You can never get around the genuine article. The genuine shines so bright that the light exposes the fraudulent. And the next day, we see Jonas Nightingale sneaking out of town, hitching a ride in a passing truck, leaving his crew behind, unnerved by what had happened, unable to stay and share in the joy of a young boy set free. The unholy and the holy, they don't mix so well. The presence of God is so gloriously present in this holy city that the glory reveals everything and everyone for what and who they really are. This is the security of the place. There is no opportunity for deception. No one is taking advantage of anyone else. There is no fear of being ripped off or done over. This is a place of healthy relating. No manipulation, no coercion, no intimidation, no deprivation, no resentment or jealousy or envy, no contentiousness or strife. People and situations are seen clearly for who and what they are and the community responds cleanly, not layering over blame, not avoiding or hiding. This is a city in which only those drawn by this unnatural way this supernatural, holy way will want to be. And it will be a good place to be. The things we need for a rich life will be there in plentiful supply. Each and every month of the year, it will be the season for a different fruit. Abundance and variety. This is a further indication of the sense of security and well-being in the city. What is requir required will be readily and freely available when it is required. I'm a bit of a stockpiler myself. The things I choose to stockpile are a bit unique to me. Dark chocolate, whiskey, tissues. <laughs> it's an odd list until you think about it. Each of those are very useful in a crisis. <laughs> The truth is, I hold more than I can reasonably expect to need, in part because I don't ever want to be without them, and my collection is a hedge against the vagaries of an uncertain future. If I had a chocolate tree, and I don't mean a cacao bush, I mean a tree that produced Haig's dark scorched almonds on them, that I could just go out the back and pick them and eat them, I would probably be less inclined to store up my packets of Hagues. Although we should be aware that insecurity actually lives in the person. It would still be possible for me to want to pick all of that and have it stored away, even until it goes off and I can't use it. Because if the insecurity is in me, it doesn't matter how much you have. Which, by the way, is why whiskey is a better option, because it doesn't go off. Yeah. <laughs> At its most extreme, this kind of insecurity becomes a psychosis. During my ministry training years ago, I was taken to visit the home of a woman whose house was so filled with rubbish that you couldn't open the front door properly. There were a stack of papers and things about that high that covered every inch of the floor. Old food wrappers, all sorts of stuff. And she wasn't lazy. She wasn't a poor housekeeper, although I guess you could say she was a poor housekeeper, but that wasn't what was going on here. She thought all this stuff might be useful. She might need it one day. And if it were cleared out, and it had been more than once, all of it, teams from different places, the church I was with had done it once, cleared out all the stuff. Very quickly she accumulates the equivalent 
again because simply she felt safer amongst her rubbish. And a more apt metaphor for materialism I cannot imagine. When we have the faith that what we need will be there when we need it, we can live more fully into our life and be set free from the rubbish we tend to comfort ourselves with. And the tree of life would seem to be quite marvellous, not only producing a variety of fruit the whole year round, but the leaves bring about healing. Healing is precisely that need we have of which we are often unaware. We grow so accustomed to resisting the world and the people around us in a particular manner, we no longer know how to do life in a different way. Our beliefs about ultimate reality can change quite significantly. However, our way of uh, intuition, our way of engaging the world is so configured deeply within us that it takes much longer to shift. We need time for our wounds to heal and we can be confident that provision will be made <coughs> excuse me, for that process to take place as well. Paul writes to the Christians in Corinth, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man builds on the foundation with gold or silver or precious stones or wood or hay or straw, each person's work will be, become evident, for the day will show it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each person's work. If anyone's work which they have built on it remains, they will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, they will suffer loss. But they themselves will be saved, yet as though through fire. Now, I don't imagine we will literally need salve to heal our skin from the refining fire's burns. However, this metaphor speaks of the way the disciples have lived their lives, and many of the priorities we have chosen will prove to have been less than helpful. And we're going to need to be healed from the ways we have chosen to live that have hurt ourselves and others. And this final bit, they will see God's face and God's name will be on their forehead. forehead. The people of this holy city will no longer be under the curse that is the result of of the fear of missing out. The fear of missing out, of course, was exactly that fear that Satan fostered in the heart of Adam and Eve. Eat the fruit. You'll not die. God's holding out on you. You're going to miss out. If you eat the fruit, you'll become like God. That's why God doesn't want you to eat it. The devastating irony being God made Adam and Eve in the divine image. They were already in the likeness of God. But the fear that they might be missing out lured them into relating destructively with each other. Abandoning the security of being held by God's love, Adam turns on Eve, blaming her while implicating God as well. The woman you gave me. Eve blame shifts as well. She goes, oh, it wasn't me. It was a serpent. Here's the culprit. Of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on. Boom, boom. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. No, it wasn't just a setup for a joke. It was actually a very degrading affair in which Adam and Eve downgraded themselves from sovereign decision-making persons to mere hapless pawns, as if they were unable to do anything but do the bidding of their unmarshaled desires in pursuit of something they had been fooled into forgetting they already had. The people of the holy city do not hide from the approach of God. Rather, they know beyond the shadow of a doubt to whom they belong. It is as though it were written across their foreheads. This identity and belonging is the ultimate security, no matter what. We know who we are and to whom we belong. At first glance, 
some might be disappointed that the ultimate metaphor of God living amongst the people is a city, albeit a holy city. But as we appreciate, it is precisely in the complex and elaborate matrix of our relationships that God is most fully revealed and known, this metaphor of the city becomes obvious. Not a city as we have done and known cities, built on fear and competition and mistrust, but a place of delightfully complex cooperation, ingenuity and joy in the good of the whole. Our task is to not be foolish or naive regarding ourselves or indeed other people and yet to live in the direction of this holy city. That's where the life is. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this vision of John. We thank you that it is both strange and wonderful to us and we want to live towards it to the glory of your name. Amen.